So I practically disappeared from YouTube for about two months. You picked the wrong <laughs> ass! Hey, 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 Big Smoke, it's me, Carl, chill, chill. CJ. I apologize for my absence, but I have had to deal with many adult things since I turned 20 years old. Right now in life, I sort of feel like an intern at a big company. I have minimal knowledge of how to excel, but know exactly what I need to do in order to survive. Ah! I'm not a man of excuses, so let's proceed to the main topic of this video. As of late, I've been watching a lot of in-depth analysis videos on certain Reddit topics. The stories and ramblings have really captivated me ever since I started, so I decided to do something similar, but with Outlast in particular. In this video, I've compiled a large amount of Reddit theories that pertain to Outlast in order to answer and build upon them. Some of the speculations will be shorter than others, but I will try my best to use the vast knowledge I have of the game in order to fabricate some new meanings. So without further ado, I introduce all to Reddit's Outlast speculations. Answered by Michael Strawn. Enjoy. In this first post, the Redditor Toe Cracking asks a question pertaining to Dr. Wernicke. It reads as follows. Do you think Dr. Wernicke might be in the Outlast Trials? If it's set in the Cold War and Wernicke came to the US during Operation Paperclip, it could be possible. This is definitely an interesting theory. And yes, I do agree the timeline gives credibility to this idea. As most Outlast enthusiasts should know, Dr. Wernick came to the United States in 1949 in order to help the United States with various top secret operations. This operation was called Project Paperclip. After assisting the United States, Dr. Wernicke allegedly retired to New Mexico, where he pursued landscape photography. However, it's never stated when Dr. Wernicke retired. It could have been in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, etc. The fact of the matter is, he could have retired one year after being recruited, but we would never know that because the information was never released. Why is that important? It's because Outlast Trials takes place in 1959, and according to Jay Lawler, either the United States government or Murkoff, with the government's help, authorized continued research of Dr. Winnicky and Project Wall Rider in 1958. This obviously suggests that Dr. Wernicke participated in the trials in order to pursue his research. I can't definitively say if Dr. Wernicke will be in Outlast Trials. Something to take into consideration is that Murkoff could have pursued Dr. Wernicke's work but didn't actually recruit him until years later when the trials failed or succeeded. Since it's never stated when Dr. Wernicke hopped out of retirement, it's completely possible he will not make an appearance. But I personally believe he will or at the very least he's going to be referenced. Just a little update. Dr. Wernicke officially did make an appearance in the trials demo. However, since it's a demo, his appearance could have just been a misleading jester to get people hyped for the game. We'll see what really happens with his character when the full game is released. This next post comes from Luis Maiba. It reads, Today, as I was watching the latest Outlast Trials BTS, I noticed that in one part of the gameplay, the date on the computer was July 21st, 2021. That made me wonder if maybe we will get the Outlast Trials this year. I have to mention that the gameplay shown in that latest BTS seemed very good. There obviously has been a lot of progress in terms of polishing a final version of the game. Hopefully, we'll hear from it in this year's Gamescom. It'll take place in August. Let me know what you think. I hope you are as tired of waiting as I am. I, unfortunately, believe that Outlast Trials will be released in 2023. I know Red Barrels release an announcement saying that there will be a closed beta test nearing the end of October, but I highly doubt they're going to release the game in November or December. The reason I don't believe the game will be released in November is that since the closed beta test is taking place at the tail end of October, Red Barrels will need some time to make some final alterations to Trials which will most definitely last longer than a month. The reason I don't believe the game will be released in December is that everyone is already going to be spending a lot of money to see the new Avatar film. There's no possible way Outlast Trials can compete with Avatar 2, so it would be financially dumb to pursue a date within that time span. Therefore, Trials will be released in April or May. This next post comes from Leather Violinist 797. 
Using actions and I already gave our theories on why this might be. If you would like to check out my version of the explanation, go to my Outlast 2 iceberg, timestamp at 25 minutes and 15 seconds. If you would like to watch using Actions' version of events, his video will pop up right now. In short, the reason why Blake keeps quiet about Jessica's murder is that Lotta Milch told Blake to keep quiet about the murder, saying it was an accident. However, Lotta Milch had little faith when it came to relying on Blake not to say anything. In order to save his own life, Blake mentioned to Lotta Milch that he and Jessica liked to play the game Hangman. This gave Lotta Milch the idea to frame Jessica's murder as a suicide. Because Jessica's mother was dead, and her father was not the most attentive man, nobody would doubt these fabricated accusations. In my Iceberg video, I provide a lot more detail and evidence for this, so go check it out. This next post comes from Raw End Rex. It reads, He's out there, somewhere. Yup, this post is extremely short. According to the Murkoff account, Issue 3, Paul Marion mentions that the Mount Massive Asylum Massacre was a 100% fatal incident. However, Paul's deduction skills are obviously lacking. As we all remember, when we first arrived at Mount Massive, the front gate is all the way open. That's the only reason Miles was able to drive in. We also must not forget the bent metal door and broken window we crawled through. I'm of the opinion that before Miles even was close to Mount Massive, some variants escaped, utilizing these escape routes. So to answer the big question, Yes, I do believe Frank Monera had a decent shot of escaping the asylum before Murkoff Tactical arrived the next morning. This next post comes from Batman Beyond, 3749. It reads, Could Miles and Blake be the same person? I know that sounds crazy. But what if one of the games is just a hallucination, while the other is what actually happened? The only real proof I have is that the ending to Outlast 1 had Miles become the host for the Wall Rider, and at the end of Outlast 2, you kind of can interpret the ending to be similar. I know this theory sounds dumb and probably isn't true, but it's just an idea. I don't believe this theory is even remotely true. Besides the fact that Miles and Blake have completely different backstories, which are explained in the games, Outlast 2 takes place two weeks after the Mount Massive incident. In other words, Pauline Glick and Paul Marion spent two weeks looking for Miles Upshore, who had access to his bank account a few hours after the Mount Massive incident. If Miles and Blake were the same person, then the Pauls would have been searching for Blake, who at that point was working for a very well-known news agency. I think everyone gets the idea. It's just impossible for this to be the case. This next post comes from our current 911. It reads, Not sure if anyone had noticed this, but Mr. Deadvent guy from Outlast is the same person that catches Waylon in the server room. This post can be interpreted in two different ways. The first interpretation is that this is the same person. If this is the case, it's actually pretty cool. We get this prequel reference to this random guy. My question would be, how the hell did he get there in the first place? Or why was he placed there by a variant? Whatever the answer, it must have been a gnarly journey for the man. The second interpretation, or should I say the fact of the matter, is that this is just a duplicate model. Obviously, at the beginning of Red Barrel's conception, they weren't as wealthy as they are now. Because of this, during the first magnum opus, they had to reuse certain models in order to add to the atmosphere. This is definitely a nice catch by the Redditor, but it's easy to explain. This next post comes from Luvija. It reads, who will become the new face of the Outlast franchise. To say the obvious, the new face of the Outlast franchise will be the primary character we play as. Who that person is, we don't know yet, but during the closed beta test at the end of October, I'm assuming we're going to find out. As for the primary villain, I definitely believe it's going to be Mother Gooseberry. This next post comes from Nerd of All Colors. It reads, I still think that Paul Marion's claim in Murkoff account is a lie. We know Murkoff isn't the most honest corporation, so I could see them easily fabricating the events and claiming they got all the inmates before they could escape. Plus, if you look at it from a logical standpoint, Murkoff's task force wasn't in there for long. They killed a bunch of inmates, that's true, but by the time they reached Traeger's body, they were all called to the basement lab where the wall rider had gone berserk due to Miles. After that, Miles killed all of them and made his way to the entrance where he killed Jeremy Blair. 
Then Miles left the asylum just after Waylon did, showing that he didn't stick around to kill off random inmates. So basically, the guards had nowhere near enough time to sweep the entire asylum before being killed by Miles, which makes it likely that several inmates escaped. Dissociative Dennis, for example, probably escaped due to his being way up in a corner of the asylum that was out of the way. The pyromaniac probably died, whether of Murkoff's volition or his own. Maybe he just jumped into the flaming chapel. Silky is probably dead as well. Frank Manera is an odd one because he was in a part of the asylum that Miles never found. So he must have been kind of out of the way. So it could go either way with him. And the same for the twins. They could have escaped or they could have been gunned down. Not sure. But bottom line is, I'm certain they didn't kill all of the inmates and Paul Marion lied. And I wouldn't be surprised if Frank Manera, the twins, and Dennis were now secretly loose on society. I completely agree with this theory. There's just too much circumstantial evidence, from the front entrance being completely wide open until it was randomly shut when Miles entered the asylum's confines to the opened window where Miles crawls through. There are just too many potential escape routes variants could have escaped through. Let's also not forget how Wayland Park escaped which was not a factor in the 100% fatal death toll Paul Marion was referring to. This next post comes from Not Ace. It reads, If anyone here has looked closely at the portraits of faces in Mount Massive, you may have noticed almost all of them have weird distortions on their face. My theory is that these photos, which were taken in the 50s or 60s, have distorted faces because of the side effects of the morphogenic engine. When the females are exposed to the engine, they get phantom pregnancies. Another side effect of the engine could be distortions on the face, especially in earlier versions of the engine. This is definitely a juicy theory. The potential for the morphogenic engine to morph or distort somebody's face over time is something I had not thought of previous to this post. Let me start off with my one objection because it came to mind first out of anything else. The reason why the faces could be distorted in the picture frames could very well be to add a heightened creepy atmosphere by red barrels. Obviously, because of the low budget, they would have wanted to add small details that would have had a massive impact on the player. I personally do remember looking at these paintings and feeling that they were off in some way. However, unlike this Redditor, I wasn't able to put my finger on why this might be. If this was added by red barrels for just atmosphere and nothing else, that involved a hidden meaning, I'd completely say this theory is false. But since it hasn't been announced to be the case, I'm in favor of this theory. Let me first point out that the morphogenic engine does harm and even destroys the victim's mind and body when hooked up. The evidence for this is the countless mutilated variants that wander the asylum, as well as Eddie Gluskin's facial transformation after being hooked up to the morphogenic engine. With this in mind, it's not too far-fetched to believe that the morphogenic engine would cause a slight mutation in facial structure when an individual is exposed to low amounts of the machine's radiation. Obviously, the evidence for this is 100% circumstantial, but considering the morphogenic engine can cause psychosomatic pregnancies, it's not impossible. The machine affects men just in a different way from women. Please give me your opinion on this theory in particular, because I am very interested to hear different interpretations. This next post comes from Fervendin6. It's a bit lengthy, so I'm just going to summarize the topic. It's speculated that Miles purchased a Sony HDR XR550V with an LEDT horseshoe mount light. That's basically the entire post. Why is this important? It's because it explains the night vision capabilities of the camera. This next post comes from Twin Drills. It reads, Is there a possibility Annalie's baby could have survived? She was eight months pregnant and the baby was reported to be healthy inside her womb. Even if she was killed, the baby still could have been saved if people were quick. Would he be premature? Perhaps, and likely brain damaged due to the lack of oxygen, but still somewhat healthy. So that would be a pretty interesting path to explore, especially if he was either raised by foster care or Murkoff. In the Murkoff account, issue 5, it's revealed that Pauline Glick murdered Anna Lee in order to cover up the Temple Gate experiments. I always wondered if the baby would have been C-sectioned after the doctors found her dead, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to implement this question in my comic book analysis because I didn't think it happened. For one, 
If the doctors didn't reach Anna Lee within a narrow time frame, the baby would have died from not receiving enough oxygen to the brain. Since we have no idea how much time passed between Pauline leaving the room and the doctors discovering the mangled corpse, it's more than likely the baby died before being C-sectioned. However, I'm not 100% opposed to this theory. Just like the Redditor says, the baby could have been delivered, but due to the lack of oxygen, might have been born with brain damage. This last post comes from Anime Ally 34. It reads, Does the Wall Rider have its own consciousness? Because even with Billy dead, it still was able to get inside Miles and kill the soldiers. I personally don't believe the Wall Rider has its own consciousness, since the Wall Rider is just a bunch of nanobots that are being controlled by a singular individual, it wouldn't make sense for this group of non-living robots to have some type of separate consciousness from Billy Hope. There hasn't been any mention of artificial intelligence either, which makes this theory more unrealistic. However, I do believe the Wall Rider is being shared by two people. These two individuals are Billy Hope and Miles Upshaw. I would also like to comment on how the Wall Rider commandeered Miles' body. When Miles hit the button to kill Billy, I believe Billy decided to inhabit Miles as a last resort in order to survive the morphogenic engine shutting down. There was one drawback though. If Billy decided to inhabit Miles, that would mean Miles would be in primary control. The reason I believe this is because in the Murkoff account issue 3, page 21, it seems that the Wall Rider is being portrayed by both Miles and Billy at separate times. For example, there are two lines of dialogue that read, You sold your boy, and he wasn't even sick, and I loved you mom. These two pieces of dialogue were said only seconds apart from each other to Billy Hope's mother. Remember, the Wall Rider is nothing more than a toggle. It's something that can only be controlled. It will never have its own consciousness. Welp, that's the end of it. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it educational in the Outlast sense. Make sure to keep an eye out for updates regarding my Outlast TV show animation. Once it releases, you'll all see why I've been super excited to show you. Anyway, I'll see all of you in the next video.